For most data engineers, as soon as something comes up, our first instinct is to dive right into the code. But as things evolve and your business impact grows as well, it's going to be your workflow around how you develop that becomes increasingly more important than just the code itself. This is going to include things like how do you actually push through your changes to production? How do you keep things updated across the board? And what about getting notified when there is an error or something goes wrong? So in this video, we're going to cover a little bit more about this topic of workflow so that you can analyze what you're doing at your company today and see if there's some ways that you can improve it going forward. The first topic we'll cover here is version control and in particular, how this impacts the entire development process. A lot of the most popular tools today in the data world are code based, not all of them, but many of them. And even if they aren't code based, they come with some element of version control many times. But despite this, there are still a lot of teams that don't have version control. And this is fortunately a very fixable mistake if you don't have it there already. Some examples of what this might look like for you is you are saving all of your code, all of your query directly into a database directly. There's no extra save of a file somewhere else, or you're doing it right into a reporting tool, all of your logic is built in there. It's not backed up. It's a direct save to production. And while a lot of times this is the way people start and it's an easy way to get going, it feels like you're not getting bogged down by process. This is unfortunately a really common area for issues. And you're really just asking for trouble at that point by doing it that way at some point. And I would highly recommend you move away from that. And so instead, what you'll want to do at some point is move to a version control platform. The most common ones here are going to be GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, to create the concept of branches and push and pull changes through a process. And I have other videos that talk about this process in particular, but if you don't have that in place, it's definitely something to look at. It's not only going to improve your development process, get it more structured, but more importantly, help prevent you from pushing through some changes that break something that impact the business. People make the wrong decision based on data. Those issues snowball down the line and it's your responsibility to be doing things responsibly. And this is one of the ways to do it. And even if you are a one person data team, so there's nobody else that is checking your code, that's doing anything. I still recommend implementing this process because at some point you're going to get busy. You're going to forget what you did or why something was changed or the steps that happened. So this is a good way to cover yourself, to be transparent and track all historical changes in your code. And whether you want to publicly admit it or not, at some point you may not be at that company anymore. So there's going to be a time where you'll have to transition that work that you did to somebody else and have to explain it, or you just want to be a good steward of the data and leave the company hopefully in a better place than when you started it. So having these things in place is going to be looking out for your future self as well in that scenario. And it's just going to be best for everybody involved. Version control is a very fundamental thing. It might sound basic, but if you don't have it highly recommend it, it's going to be something that once you implement it, you're going to have a hard time working on teams where it's not in place. Now, outside of the actual development, another core component of the workflow is how you refresh your data. You might be surprised, but even today, we're in 2025, there are still a good amount of teams that are manually refreshing their data models or their data pipelines every day. It's a manual process. And my goal here with this section is just to remind you to move away from that as quickly as possible. So mainly you can free up your time. There's really not a whole lot of good reasons to be manually handling this process. This is a solved problem. Now, many modern architectures, the different components and activities are split between tools. So you might have data ingestion in one tool and a separate tool dedicated for transformation and it's split. But fortunately, most of them can also be scheduled fairly easily. They have cadences and scheduling features built into them. So the key here is to make sure you're aware of the timing and you don't have them overlapping each other. For example, if you're just getting started, you don't want to have a separate orchestration tool because those might be a little complicated to set up. You just need to make sure that you run one after the other. For example, you have data ingestion running every day at 5 a.m. And then the data transformation you have scheduled at 6 or 7 a.m. If you know that it's only going to take 30 minutes, 60 minutes for something to run, there's really no reason you can't have both of those scheduled, even if they're separate and be pretty confident most of the time, 99% of the time, it's not going to be a problem. And in the case that something does happen, then it'll notify you and you can react accordingly. Alternatively, the natural progression of this is to set up what's called an orchestration tool that sits on top of all the tools in your stack and effectively operates as a control plane to schedule things in a more robust way. But this is something that can be helpful more as you scale. And it's not something that's necessarily, at least in my opinion, required when you're getting started just to avoid added complexity and maintenance for setting that up. You can still get pretty far by just using the basic tools in front of you and then only adding on later as you see fit. Now, once you have your developers using version control in their workflow, you have your data refreshing, hopefully automatically every day. The last piece is you still want a process in place 
to keep an eye on the data quality. And to me, this is where the idea of seeing data architecture, not as individual parts, but more of a collective system starts to come into view and in how things play off of each other. So for example, you can set up automated checks through your version control platform to help you catch errors in isolation in lower level environments. So if you use command line tools like DBT, you can deploy your models into a test environment, something that's pre-production and run these DBT test commands automatically to validate the new logic before it ever hits production. But the idea here is it's checked checking on your behalf what you've done. So this is that advanced use of the version control platform outside of just tracking changes. You can check for data quality automatically, but it's also not good enough to just be checking for errors. You also want to have a way to get notified of it and hopefully immediately. Fortunately, most of the tools and it, definitely the version control tools come built in with functionality to send you an email or integrate directly with messaging tools. For example, something errors out in your version control check, it then sends a message directly to your Slack channel and you can immediately go fix it. And it just makes your workflow much more efficient rather than you having to keep an eye on everything yourself. This process is something that a lot of executives and higher ups at companies want to know about. And it's usually the, one of the first things that comes up when asking about data architecture, because they just want to know that whatever is being built, that there's something there to catch issues. And it's probably because they've been burned in the past. Maybe there was an important stakeholder or external customer who was able to catch an error and report it back to them before they caught it internally. And it's never a good look when that happens. So when it comes to errors, it's always best to be the ones catching it first internally. And it's not the error itself that is necessarily the problem because these things happen, right? It happens over time, you can't be 100%. But the thing is when it happens too often, it starts to impact the trust and the confidence in the data itself. And it's really hard to build that back. So that's why it's really important to have systems in place to catch errors on the way and to manage that. And in those situations, the best thing you can do is simply over communicate, be transparent and get out in front of what's happening. Doing it this way showcases to others in that scenario that you're still on top of things, that you know what's going on. And the sooner you can do this, it also avoids somebody else from spending spending their time trying to put together proof that something is off because nobody wants to do that. It's a bad use of their time. And it's something that as a data professional, you should be getting out in front of as much as you can. And so the idea here is to build these systems, have processes in place to take care of that for you. As engineers, it's easy and a lot of fun mostly to get lost in just writing the code, but how we write the code, how we have our workflow and keep things updated is equally as important, especially as things grow. But hopefully now you have a better understanding of how workflow plays into this entire data development process and you can adjust things on your end where you see fit. But thanks as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.